Today we'll be in verses 21 through 28. Mark chapter 1, 21 through 28. Let me read those to you. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice, and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding districts of Galilee. We all have to deal with authority figures each and every day in our lives, don't we? As children, we have parents as our authority. When children go to school, they have teachers as their authority. We move on into adulthood, we have employers as our authority. Politicians have some sort of authority over us as we elect them and they determine the laws of the land. And as those laws are handed down, law enforcement, police officers become our authority as they work to keep us safe as we abide by the laws of our elected officials. As Christians, we have authority over us, and, and that is God himself. He's the ultimate authority, because God is the creator of all things. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything that exists was created by God, and by that fact, God is our ultimate authority over all things. When Moses delivered the law to the Israelites, God's sovereign authority was based on which was handed down to them. We see that in Deuteronomy 4, verses 39 and 40, which says, Know therefore today, and take it to your heart, that the Lord, He is God in heaven above and on earth below, there is no other. So you shall keep His statutes and His commandments, which I am giving you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may live long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. So God is our ultimate authority, but also the Word of God is our authority as we seek to live in accordance with what God says. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, is inspired by God, and it's profitable for reproof, for teaching, for correction, for training in righteousness. But as we move on in our exposition in the Gospel of Mark, he begins to describe the historical accounts of Jesus by characterizing him as one with ultimate authority. So in our text, Mark describes two events describing Jesus' authority that left the people in utter amazement. And it should also leave us amazed as we focus on Jesus' words and his actions. So my outline today in these two events are Jesus' authority in his teaching, verses 21 and 22, and then Jesus' authority in his commandments, verses 23 through 28. Jesus' authority in his teachings and Jesus' authority in his commands. So point number one, Jesus' authority in his teachings. Look back with me at verses 21 and 22 in Mark chapter 1. It says this, they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. So within these verses, Mark 
moves on from the introduction he has of Jesus and begins to give us the historical ramifications of what Jesus does throughout his ministry. After he was heralded in by John the Baptist, remember he was commissioned for this ministry by the Father and filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Then he was impelled by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, walked away victorious over Satan in his temptation. And as he begins his preaching ministry, he's accompanied by some fishermen that he called to follow him. But here is where Mark begins to kind of pull back the reins. Remember, Mark is very fast-paced, but here he slows down a tad, and he explains and focuses more on the specific events of Jesus. And he gives us more information regarding Jesus and his ministry. And he begins this account in Jesus' ministry by giving us again his location. They went into Capernaum. So Capernaum was one of many towns and villages along the Sea of Galilee. Remember, he, he was going along the Sea of Galilee. He called Peter, Andrew, James, and John to come follow him. So this is a city on the Sea of Galilee. So we saw a couple weeks ago, he was in the region of Galilee preaching and teaching. And Capernaum is in the northwest corner of this sea. And it literally means village of Nahum. Village of Nahum. And it could more likely be the hometown of the Old Testament prophet who wrote the book of Nahum. But it was a very busy city and a very prosperous one at that. First century Jewish historian Josephus stated about Capernaum, he said this, Capernaum's nature is wonderful as well as its beauty. Its soil is so fruitful that all sorts of trees can grow upon it. One may call this place the ambition of nature, where it focuses those, or forces those plants that are naturally enemies to one another to agree with each other. It is a happy contention of the seasons, as if every one of them laid claim to this country. So this was a very fruitful city. According to other historians, it was built on a major Roman road. Therefore, making it a very important commercial city. It had a promenade that stretched nearly a half a mile long, and it sat on top of an eight-foot seawall. And out of that seawall, there were piers that, that went out into the sea about 100 feet. So giving fishing boats and fishermen easy access to the city. It was probably where Peter, Andrew, James, and John conducted their fishing business. And as we look further in Mark 129, it was probably where Peter had, had a house. Matthew gives us the only location we know regarding the location of Capernaum in Matthew 4.13. He says, In leaving Nazareth, he, speaking of Jesus, went and dwelt in Capernaum by the sea, in the terry of Zebulun and Naphtali. So Capernaum became the established headquarters of Jesus during his Galilean ministry. And we see that again in Mark 2, verse 1. When Jesus had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. So Capernaum was home base for Jesus. So what does Jesus do upon coming to Capernaum? It says he enters the synagogue and begins to teach. And this isn't something unusual for Jesus. Remember, he came to preach and teach the gospel of God in verse 15 of Mark 1. Luke explains this more specifically in Luke 4, 16. He says, and he, speaking of Jesus, came to Nazareth, and he had been brought up, and as, he was, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And I think it's important to understand that the, the temple in Jerusalem and the synagogue, they're, they're not... This one and the same. You know, the temple of the, in Jerusalem was where people went to worship, offer sacrifices, etc. But the synagogues were spread out throughout different cities. And it was a place of assembly to hear and learn from the scriptures. The word synagogue literally means a gathering place or a place of assembly. And what would happen within these gatherings 
is a service would take place, specifically on the Sabbath. They would likely offer prayers. They would read from the law and the prophets. A sermon of that reading would take place and there would be a benediction, kind of like what we do today. And it was always Jewish custom to allow visiting teachers to speak by invitation in the synagogues. So with Jesus' popularity growing, it's not uncommon for him to be asked to give the message in that synagogue. That was nothing out of the ordinary. And Mark doesn't really give us the details of Jesus' message, but it was likely a reading from the law or the prophets. But after he reads the text, Mark says, he began to teach. And the response Jesus gets is nothing but extraordinary. And I think that's what Mark is trying to relate to us here. Because in Mark, verse, chapter 1, verse 22, it says this, And they, the people who heard this, were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. So again, as Mark doesn't give us the content of this message. Mark wants to draw our attention to the response of this message. What the message sounded like and what it didn't sound like. And the response of this message was one of amazement. The word Mark used here for amazement of Jesus' teaching literally means this, to cause someone to be filled with such amazement to the point of being overwhelmed. The idea is not only were they surprised at this type of teaching, they were overwhelmed because they had never heard anyone teach like this before. They were in total shock to the point of having their minds blown. They were utterly speechless. I mean, have you ever heard a sermon where it just convicts you so much that you can't even speak after it? Whether it brings about tears or just you're, something, the Spirit just illuminates your mind and you're just in awe of what God says in His Word. That has happened to me more often than not. And to think that a fallen individual, through the work of the Holy Spirit, can cause us to be so convicted that we can't even utter a word after hearing the Word of God preached. And to think that these men, or these people, got to hear Jesus speaking directly must have been a hundred, if not a thousand times better than what we have ever experienced or heard. And that's what Mark is trying to explain here. The mindset of the people, after hearing Jesus teaching and preaching, must have been mind-blowing. And why would they be acting that way? Why? Why is their mind blown? Mark says, for his teaching was to them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The message was one of authority. Jesus taught with authority, which speaks of rule, which speaks of dominion, which speaks of power, which speaks of privilege. So much so that he left people speechless. So amazed, they didn't even know how to respond. And we see this reaction numerous times throughout the Gospel of Mark, which again should draw our minds back to his opening statement. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So when Jesus is teaching, he's exercising power because of his high position as the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus taught with authority because he is the authority. He didn't get his teachings from other rabbis. He didn't get his teaching from different commentaries or different theologians. That is why they were so amazed. Because he didn't sound like the people that they were used to hearing. His teaching was not as the scribes. I love what R.C. Sproul states regarding the contrast of Jesus and the scribes. He says it this way. Of course, the scribes were not without their own authority. They were the most learned expositors of the Old Testament law. Scribes were like PhDs in theology of our day. And their opinions 
were accorded great weight by those who heard them. But when Jesus spoke, he invoked an authority far beyond anything the people had experienced with the scribes. The scribes could cite other scholars and rabbinic traditions. They could try to marshal arguments to support what they were teaching, just as we try to do today in our academic world. But Jesus did not do that. He provided no footnote, no citations, no marshalling of other people's arguments. His teaching might have inspired bumper stickers on the chariots in those days, which read, Jesus said it, that settles it. When God says something, the argument is over. Since we are not told the content of this message, we know that there were stark contrasts with that of the scribes. And we can assume that Jesus was not teaching about keeping mere rules. His teaching was in harmony with God's kingdom that was now being established through him. Mark has already given us a summary of what Jesus taught and preached in verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus may have well been preaching that same message, but he was preaching it as fact. This is the authority. But once again, Mark continually points us back, reminding us where the authority lies and who it comes from. It is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we see the people's amazement at the authority of this teaching. And it should come to the forefront of our minds as we move on to the next event. The authority in his commands. We saw Jesus preach with authority. The people were amazed. They were speechless. But what comes next is just as astonishing, if not more. Point number two. Jesus' authority in his commands. Look with me in Mark 1, 23 through 28. As Jesus is teaching... As people are speechless, Mark says, Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do you have with each other, or do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him? Immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding districts of Galilee. So as Jesus is teaching... There's utter silence. People are speechless. You could hear a pin drop. Just then, Mark says, there's a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. Now I want you to notice something here. And I think it's very important. Mark, throughout the first chapter, is very keen on locations. Okay, He talks about the wilderness. He talks about the region of Galilee. We talked about him coming into Capernaum. Where was this man located? He was in their synagogue. He was in their midst. He was among the religious elite. He was in their religious establishments. He was with those who gathered together to hear the word taught. And this is important because we need to be aware of this today. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy everything that God has made and established. I mean, you think of the institution of the family. I mean, it's been marred by Satan today. We see divorce rates climb. We see marriage decrease. We see kids living without a mother and father in the home. Sexual sin is rampant. It's ignored. It's normal. It's even celebrated in our culture. 
I mean, someone is more than likely to gain adoption privileges by being a same-sex couple than someone who is a husband and a wife. You take that establishment away and, and there's utter chaos. Then you move on to the establishment of government. Another institution ordained by God. We've seen it as of late. Groups have infiltrated our culture. They've cried to demolish law enforcement, to defund police officers. High crime is uncontrollable because of elected officials, elected DAs who, who fail to punish crime as they should. You just watch the news. It's a total disaster. We are in a war. This is a spiritual war that we are fighting. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy every institution that God ordained. The family, the government, law enforcement, but most importantly, he wants to destroy the church. And he has already infiltrated the church. We see it here in Jesus' time, and it's prevalent today. He wants nothing more than Grace Community Bible Church to fail. The one-year anniversary of Grace Community Bible Church. He doesn't want this church in existence. He wants it to fail. He wants to divide us. He wants us to compromise. And we can never compromise. We have to stand firm in the Lord and in the strength of His might. We have to stand on the firm foundation of the Word of God. We must trust in the promises of God. It is Christ who builds his church. We must remain faithful to the word of God because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church who relies heavily and solely on the word of God. Last week we celebrated what? The resurrection. We talked about the proof of the resurrection. I mentioned Lee Strobel. Remember he fought to expose the lie that his wife became a born-again Christian. He wanted to expose the resurrection. So he gathered all this information, but he had to align it with what the Scriptures said. But he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. It's impossible. So he fell on his knees and surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. I mean, what's my point in all of this? My point is, everything we do here in this church must always align with what God says in His Word. Every circumstance must come through and be viewed through the lens of Scripture. If we compromise, Satan won. Because compromise leads only to destruction. And that's exactly what Satan wants, especially at Grace Community Bible Church. We need to be careful in all our situations. That is why we must study and solely rely on how the, what the Word says and how it directs our lives. Satan, who is the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world, wants nothing more than for the church to fail. He wants to destroy it, and we cannot let that happen. So we must preach truth, no matter the cost just as Jesus did, just as those who went before us did. That's why church history is important. Because it emboldens us as men and women gave their life for truth. It emboldens us to stay in the truth of the Word of God. That is what we must do. Because when the truth is pre preached, Satan is waiting. We see it here in this text. It's not surprising to find this interaction. Satan and his demons hide in the middle of religion. They hide in the church. They disguise themselves as angels of light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. They promote error and deceit, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Jesus himself gave the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. That, that parable depicts Satan's effort to deceive the church by mingling his children with God's. And in some cases, it's impossible for us to distinguish the true among the false. So what do we do? Do we just say, well, I just give up? No, we do exactly what Jesus did. We continue to preach the word in truth, and we do it with authority. As Paul says to Titus in 2.15, Titus 
Because when the word and the truth is preached, one of two things is going to happen. One of two things will happen. Either these people are going to get saved, and God is going to draw them to himself, and he's going to save them, or they will leave. They will leave. But we must always speak truth, because that is exactly what Jesus did. He preached truth like nobody has ever heard before. And the people were amazed. But when this man who is in their synagogue, among them, heard this truth being ta taught, he could not handle himself. So in the midst of silence, this man cries out. And the word Mark used for cried out expresses a strong emotional stress what the demon did was he used this man's voice to scream and shout with the strongest emotion possible. It was so intense, really describing the shrieks of someone who is experiencing intense agony. I mean, imagine this scene. The room is completely silent. You're hearing Jesus teach and your mind is blown. You can't even utter a word. And then something so horrifying, so strong comes out of this man who is in their midst. It must have startled everybody in that room. As Jesus was preaching truth, this demon couldn't handle it any longer, and he cries out, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? The Greek literally says this, What to us and to you, Jesus of Nazareth? Which is basically saying, what commonality do we have with each other, Jesus? I mean, the answer to this question to us is, is obvious. Absolutely nothing. They have nothing in common. Paul talks of this in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, in which he asks, what partisanship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? The demons and Satan have nothing in common with Jesus Christ. They represent two different realms. They represent the realm of Satan, and they represent the realm of God. The only relationship that this demon has with Christ is one of conflict. And that is what he is reiterating here. What in common do we have with each other? Absolutely nothing. And he already knew the answer. But as Jesus was preaching truth, this demon, using the man to express himself, burst forth in sheer terror because he knows who is in front of him. Because that's what he says. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I mean, notice the plurality that this demon uses. He says, what commonality do we have with each other? Have you come to destroy us? And I don't think he's... He's talking about the demon and this man that he possesses. No, I think he's talking about the whole spiritual realm. I mean, if you remember, Satan, when he fell, he took a third of the angels with him. And they knew when they left, when they fell, they were irredeemable. They would one day be cast into the lake of fire. Matthew 25, 41 explains that the lake of fire is prepared specifically for the devil and his angels. So he asks... Is now the time? Have you come to destroy us? Because they know the only one who can cast them into the lake of fire is God himself. So as he addresses Jesus. He says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. The demon declares, I know, because he is not telling a lie. There are certain things that this demon knows for sure, and he definitely knows who Jesus is. His identity caused such great fear and trembling. Because James reiterates this in James 2.19. He says, the demons believe that Jesus is the Christ. He, they believe and they shudder in utter terror. Demons know that there is no salvation for them. There's only punishment. And this demon is thinking of that very fact. He realizes that at this moment, being confronted with the Holy One of God, the one who can cast him into eternal punishment, he knows that holiness does not tolerate sin. 
There is nothing in common with him and Jesus. So he's terrified, and he should be. Because Jesus has authority over him, as well as authority over the whole realm of, spiritual, of the spiritual world. He was fully aware of Jesus' divine nature, and fully aware of his authority. Jesus is the Holy One of God. And again, I think that's Mark's purpose here. Because the demon uses two identifying factors explaining who Jesus is. He says, first, Jesus of Nazareth, claiming Christ's humanity. And then he claims he is the Holy One of God, explaining that Jesus is, in fact, truly deity. But Jesus does not accept any acknowledgement coming from this thoroughly corrupt demon. Because what comes next? Jesus rebukes him, which expresses a strong disapproval of this spiritual force. And then he gives the demon two commands. Two commands, two imperatives. He says, be quiet and come out of him. The word here used for be quiet is, is literally be muzzled. Jesus basically said, put a muzzle on it. Shut up. Kids, I can say that today. <laughs> and come out right now. He was commanding this demon with such sharp commands that the demon had no choice but to instantly obey. Because we see what happens next in verse 26. Throwing this man into convulsions, the evil spirit or the unclean spirit cries out with a loud voice and came out of him. This demon preferred to remain with this man, to hold him captive, but he knew he had no power against the Holy One of God. So with one final protest, he causes this man to go in some sort of convulsions, cries out, and immediately comes out of this man. Luke's Gospel states that the demon threw the man down, came out of him, without doing him any harm. So the man was not hurt in any way, shape, or form. And we're not told whatever happened to this man, but that isn't the point of this story. What Mark is trying to do is draw all our attention on Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate authority. He has ultimate authority. He has the power to break the bondage of Satan. Jesus alone can destroy the works of the devil. He is the only one who could dismantle his forces. 1 John 3, 8 says, The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Only Jesus can deliver blind souls, blind souls who are held captive by the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And the response after this event is nothing but astonishing. Verses 27 and 28, and they were all amazed so that they debated among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? God commands even the, un or he, Jesus, commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him? And immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. <coughs> So I want you to notice something here. We see people amazed two times in this passage. First in, in verse 22, amazed at his teaching, and that, then now here, amazed at this new teaching, but again, casting out this demon. Mark uses two Greek words to describe their amazement. It's not the same word. But the overall impression and the meaning are the same. Again, it expresses utter amazement. Astonishment, speechless. And I think Mark using these different words, he wants to communicate to his readers and to us that Jesus constantly filled people with a mixture of wonder, a mixture of awe, a mixture of fear. Because Jesus does exactly what he says he will do and and he says exactly what he says is true. He taught like no one else has ever taught. He had authority in his teaching. And he occupied power and the force like no one else 
that they have ever seen before in their life. He had authority in his commands, even to cast out an unclean spirit. So the news spread like wildfire. Jesus' popularity grew immensely. The question that seemed to be on everybody's tongue at that time was, why is this? Who in the world is this man? But Mark tells us in his opening statement, this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The demon tells us who Jesus is. He is the Holy One of God. He is 100% man, 100% God. And people need to approach him as that. They should be both terrified and amazed. Terrified that he is coming to judge the world in righteousness. That's Acts 17, 30 and 31. Paul says God is now declaring to all men everywhere to repent because he has a fixed a point or he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead he's speaking of Jesus they should be terrified sinners should be terrified at that but again we have hope and we can be amazed that he alone paid the penalty for sin when he died on the cross. Galatians 3, 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. We need to fear him as a judge, but we need to run to him as our savior. And sadly, people don't do that. People deny Jesus. And when they deny Jesus, they show less insight than that of the demons. Think of it. When they don't recognize Jesus as who he is, they show less insight than that of the demons. That is a sad state to be in. R.C. Ryle states it this way. The mere belief of the facts and doctrines of Christianity will never save your soul. Such belief is no better than the belief of devils. They all believe and know that Jesus is the Christ. They believe that he will one day judge the world and cast them down to endless torment in hell. It is a solemn and sorrowful thought that on these points, some professing Christians have even less faith than that of the devil. There are some who doubt the reality of hell and the eternity of punishment. Such doubts as these find no place except in the hearts of self-willed men and women. What a sad state to be in. So we need to ask ourselves this morning, is the faith that we have in Jesus, is it embedded into the deepest part of our soul? And is it evidenced by the life that we live? Or is it merely in our head? Is it merely in our head? Does our faith produce in us a sanctifying influence in our life and our affections towards the Lord and towards others? It's one thing to know about Jesus Christ, but it's another thing to love him and obey him. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. So I just don't want to have a head knowledge that, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. But I want you to rejoice in that. I want you to cleave to him with one purpose, and that's to glorify him. I love Westminster Shorter Catechism. The first question, what is the chief end of man? Why are we here? It's to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We're created for his glory, but God in his grace has a relationship with him. We can enjoy him. Isn't that amazing? We can enjoy God. So let's not only acquaint ourselves with him 
by the mere hearing of his teaching. Let's not just come to church and say, you know what? Check. Check box. I've done my good deed. Now I can do whatever I want. That's what's infiltrated America. That's what's infiltrated evangelicalism. You come to church and you're okay. It's not going to infiltrate here. I'm not going to let it. I'm going to teach the truth. It's, it, that's, that's all I know how. Like I told you guys, when I came here, I don't have anything outside of what the Bible says. I have to stand on the truth. We can't compromise. We have to live out our profession in daily personal application to Him and we give thanks to Him for His mercy, for His grace and His kindness towards us. God demonstrated His love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ would die for us. Martin Luther stated this, the life of Christianity consists in possessive pronouns. It's one thing to say Christ is a Savior. It's quite another thing to say He is my Savior and He is my Lord. Because you know what? The devil can say the first thing. But a true, born-again Christian alone can say the second. Can you say that today? Or do you just have a head knowledge of Jesus? Do you tremble at the thought of standing before a holy God as a demon would? Because if you do, run to the cross. Cling to the cross. And if you don't, listen to this message because the demon Shout it out in fear. He was in the midst of a church service, hearing the Bible taught. They are in our midst. Are you born again? Can you say that? He is my Lord. He is my Savior. If not, I beg you to come talk to me, talk to someone. Don't leave here. Because you do not know the day or the hour, the minute, the second of your death. 150,000 people die every day. You could be one today. Today is the day of salvation. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Sinners, enemies of God, are transferred from darkness to light, from death to life, from in Adam to in Christ. Nothing, nothing we ever could do could measure up to the perfection that God requires. It, it can only happen in the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life, who went and sacrificially atoned for sinners on the cross by shedding the precious, perfect blood and God was so satisfied with that satisfaction, declared him to be the Son of God by raising him from the dead. And he offers a gift of salvation to those who would believe. Do you believe in that? Repent of your sin. Turn from your sin. Forsake them. They're not worth it. Either you will pay for your sin in eternal damnation, in eternal hell, or they have already been paid for on the cross. Which is it? Which is it today? Will you bow your knee to Christ today or will you bow in utter fear? Bob read that passage this morning. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. For what? To the glory of God the Father. It's all for Him. It's all His glory. So which is it today? Are we going to walk out these doors and are we going to live and walk in a manner worthy of our calling? Are we going to surrender to His Lordship if you haven't already? I beg you, come to Him. 
I'm here. I want to help you. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I want everybody to experience the surpassing greatness. That's what we talked about last night in Ephesians 1. To be enlightened. Come to Christ today and live. He is the ultimate authority. But yet he's kind and good and compassionate, loving kindness, not willing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, I do thank you for the gospel. I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the gospel of Mark. Thank you for the teaching of Jesus. I thank you for the eyewitnesses you had carry on that message as we were going through Acts this morning. I, I just thank you for everyone who stood firm on the truth. And I pray, Lord, that Grace Community Bible Church will not compromise that we will stand firm in what the Bible says. Saint wants nothing more than for this year-old church to be destroyed. Father, give us the strength to stand firm in the strength of your might, to pray with each other, to encourage each other, to uplift each other, and to be pure until we see Jesus just as he is. As you say in 1 Peter, we are to be holy as you are holy. Lord, if there is someone here who is not sure they have eternal life, Lord, please prick their hearts. I pray that today is the day that they are transferred from darkness to light. Thank you for this time. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.